Okay, we are the Gray Swan Guild, and this is the GSG Book Festival 2023 edition. Thank you, Will Steele, and your new book, The Spark, all the way from Texas in Austin, one of my favorite places in the, U the U.S. because it's the most liberal town in Texas. And we're in our next segment, and uh, it's a future theme. We're going from fiction to super fiction with Fernando Gutierrez, a friend of the guild, a golden swan. We work together on a bunch of projects and productions together. He's a consummate professional. He's brought some of his fellow writers with him that have engaged, engaged in partnership. And we're gonna talk about a new book uh, called Eco-Fascism, Leviathan, and another L word. Yeah, and or Lifesaver. Leviathan or Lifesaver. We're going to talk about yeah. the motivation of the title and we're going to walk you through. Please introduce yourself to the crowd and who's helping you out here and what we want to do together. Sylvia, thank you for joining us. Always great to be on screen with you. Look forward to this. Gina, I'm waving at you too because I know you've been involved with this. So Fernando, I will hand over the screen and everything else to you. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it for you. Absolutely, thank you. I do have a presentation to share, so I'll go ahead and uh, go ahead and start have sharing. Let's see here. Okay, that should start coming your way. All right, how's that look? It looks perfect. Okay, nice great. Job. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, so um, uh, my name is Fernando Gutierrez. Well, I saw that I was born in Uruguay, uh, obviously raised in the States, um, and, you know, uh, based on my accent. Um, the book that um, that I'm going to be discussing today, uh, I'm going to be doing it along with uh, a couple of the authors. Um, Gina Clifford is, is joining us as well as Sylvia Galliser. Um, and we're going to be talking about um, our book that is forthcoming in 2024. Um, so as you mentioned, um, Rob, the title of the book is Ecofascism, Leviathan or Lifesaver. Um, and the coordinator for this book um, is Hame Enciso, and he's out of Spain. And our art designer is Andre Aruda, and he's out of Brazil. And I myself am uh, the editor of the book. So I'm, I'm going through all the different um, submissions for the book and uh, and editing. So yeah, so that's that's what we're going to be talking about today um, is is our book. So uh, so what is eco fascism? Let's start with that, because, you know, when we talk about eco, you usually think of something that's a bit more kind of left leaning, uh, you know, eating kale and, you know, recycling and what have you. And fascism tends to be more uh, right wing, at least in the US, you know, um, uh, and, and in Europe, traditionally, um, it's, it's been uh, more about uh, uh, religious conservatism and things like that. So um, the idea is um, that the year is 2050 and that there has been a global temperature increase um, of more than two degrees Celsius. Um, and, you know, so we've got some serious climate change going on and the global population is now uh, topped off at almost 10 billion, 9.8 billion. So what we're seeing in, in, our, in, our, um, in our fictional prompt here is a new global movement that's arisen. It's known as ECOF and it's a totalitarian system that has taken over the earth. And this uh, system that we're calling ecofascism um, is seeking to enforce um, the minimization of the climate footprint for every person uh, on the planet and for every aspect of society. So this is a totalitarian regime um, that is based on um, essentially um, saving the planet. So, um, you know, it's a little bit of a, uh, of a uh, interesting term um, that, uh, that Hama had come up with. Um, it's certainly very intriguing, not something that we normally put together, um, those two concepts. So that's, that's where that comes from. And, and so the, the work itself, um, Ego Fascism, Leviathan, or Lifesaver. Um, it's a futurist and critical collection. Um, and what we collect is visions of different um, facets of eco fascist futures. Um, so, again, like I said, 2050. So, what might that world look like? And lots of different 
lots of different perspectives on that. Um, it is a multi-author book. We've got um, 40 of the top futurists from across the globe um, and me. <laughs> um, but no, we've got we've got some really great folks on, on this, uh, including uh, Gina and Sylvia, um, who will be presenting today. Um, and so what we've done in this collection is we've we've uh, gathered um, these 40 or so different works um, and each one is about five to 600 words. Um, so they're, they're short features, um, you know, like a short article or, you know, it basically um, the different authors have had different concepts of, of what they want to write and we've given them a lot of free reign on that. And so once, um, once the authors have put together, um, had put together their, their pieces, what we then started doing um, was uh, started uh, creating AI generated illustrations for them. So, and I do know how to spell illustrations, but obviously uh, <laughs> not, not today. So um, going through actually, if, if all this, all the, all the um, images that you've seen so far in the background of this slideshow with the exception of the Grace Swan Guild um, splash page at the front have been AI generated for the book. So uh, there's multiples for each story. So these may or may not uh, wind up in the book, but these have all been um, generated as part of, of the book. So um, you can see there's an interesting one with the World Council and, uh, and you, you know, you've got this kind of interesting concept of, uh, of maybe a distribution center. I'm not sure exactly which story this one's out of. Um, and so, yeah. Um, so I am going to hand it over mon momentarily to uh, to Gina to begin talking about her um, her work. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's definitely been an interesting mission, um, and it's uh, it's been a little bit of a challenge in terms of finding a publisher. So uh, we're still kind of working that out. But um, some of these, uh, and well, I'm not going to say some. All of the all the pieces I've read are very intriguing. They're very thought provoking, and uh, one thing that I should mention as well is is these authors are from, like I said, from across the globe. So we've got um, folks from Asia, we've got folks from Latin America, we've got uh, folks from Europe, uh, United States, Canada, you know, North America, um, basically everyone around the world. And and um, as the editor, getting to to look through these, it's really amazing to see the different. Um, the different viewpoints. It's so easy, certainly as futurists, um, to kind of get, uh, I don't know if complacent is the right word, but uh, kind of set in your ways in terms of your viewpoint, um, whether, you know, you're, you're uh, in North America, like I am, or, you know, in Europe. Um, um, and um, it's just great to um, be able to see these voices from, from lots of, um, lots of different um, parts of the globe, lots of different cultures, lots of different perspectives. Um, not only ways of seeing the world, but also ways of seeing the future. Um, because different cultures uh, view the future in different ways. Some see it more linear, um, as we do in the West. Some see it more cyclical. Uh, others see um, uh, futures and social change coming in waves. Um, or, uh, or uh, you know, lots lots of different perspectives uh, on it, so it's it's pretty pretty neat to uh, to be able to to be kind of front and center on that. And I'm excited um, from everything I've read, and I'm ex I'm excited um, for the images that that we've generated so far. And uh, um, I'm really looking forward to to being able to share the entire work um, with the world next year. So. Um, Without further ado, let me go ahead and hand it over to Gina, because I know, Gina, you're on a little bit of a time crunch. So um, we've got you up first to talk about um, your uh, your submission called It's 2050. Is your life legal? illegal? Thank you, Fernando. I appreciate it. And uh, hi, Sylvia. I, yeah, always honored to be on a conversation uh, with, with you and Sylvia. So thank you for inviting me. And uh, I'm also very grateful to be part of this project. Uh, I wrote a few more than 500 words. I think mine ended up being about 1,500 words, but you know, if it has to be pared down, so be it. So it's really hard to talk about this topic in 500 words. It's almost uh, impossible. Even 1,500 words seemed like a, a really crunched uh, version of it. So in my story, I, I kind of built, did a little bit of world building because I envisioned this story 
as part of a bigger story. And I would, you know, I probably will continue to develop this story as part of a bigger, uh, more in depth, go in background into characters and things. But I did start the development of characters, and the themes that I that I um, focused on was that okay, we're living in a totalitarian world, right? So most of the governments, if not all of them, have kind of shifted in that direction. Climate change has created all kinds of human uh, disasters. So, so in my in my take on this, instead of governments back you know in, in this time right now doing anything to keep the climate change from happening, that meant, mindset is that well technology will fix it. So I took the so I, I intentionally used a lot of references to technology. I didn't go into depth on how they work and everything you know limited on uh, words there. But um, tried to paint that picture, that world of every, everything, every facet of our life is high tech. Everything is, is really cool and whiz bang. And we have these suits and we have these implants that allow us, you know, AR visual that's connected to the web and really powerful AI assistance built in all the time. Kind of stuff we're talking about right now, but it's yeah, basically everybody has it. But life isn't better. And that's where I kind of explore the idea of governments kind of decide that will create earth finally they're looking at earth as a system a carbon system and in order to manage uh manage the carbon manage the the procreation that uh everyone has to register their dna and of course procreation isn't automatic you don't get to choose governments choose who gets to procreate I didn't explore all of the ramifications of that, but you know we can think about things that are happening right now uh, and why that's a bad idea. But I didn't, you know, I wanted to leave it open to the reader to, to kind of fill in those blanks, like ask those questions. So it's a little bit provocative in that it doesn't put a point on it, right? It doesn't define that uh, what those things are. It leaves it to the reader to think about those implications, and you know, maybe if I do expand on the story. I will I will fill in those gaps a little bit, but um, so the underlying part of this is that DNA is data. So of course, uh, totalitarian governments they want to control everything. And if you think about what's happening right now with artificial intelligence, it's it's all the rage. Everyone's talking about it, but it's going to be it's going to be everywhere all the time. It's going to be part of our living, just like breathing air. By 2050, God knows what it will be doing. But data is going to be at the center of it. And um, so the scary thing is that if you're not, in, in my story, if you're not registered, your DNA is not registered, you're illegal. So hence the title, Is Your Life Illegal? And then, of course, the uh, one of my characters kind of lives that high-tech life and, you know, it, it, there's references to this black market kind of app store for all these cool uh, add-ons to the suit and to do cool things to your vehicles. And of course, hydrogen vehicles are kind of a thing. So we have all the technology in place to, quote, manage life in a totalitarian society where everything is controlled. But uh, the, the overarching theme that I was going for is that technology doesn't really solve it all. It has to come from people. And then, so I kind of leave people wondering what's gonna happen next when uh, my character, my main character finds, discovers that a plant that has bioincorporated some sort of technology, whether it's a lens, whether it's a camera, you know, I don't, I don't really go into the details, but it has done that through, through its own evolution and mutation. And, but it's illegal because it's not registered. And if it is registered, then it's going to be the someone the government is going to decide what to do with it. So I used kind of that as a vehicle to say, you, you could pick anything that is different. It doesn't have to be this crazy plant. And if it's not registered, it's illegal. And what happens to a society when every single organism is decided by humans whether it's illegal and quote allowed, or if it's exterminated or exterminated, basically by not allowing to 
procreate to the future? And you know, where does that where does that leave the earth? Where does that leave humanity? Uh, when we we think we're at the top of the food chain and and we're making calling all the shots, but uh, so I kind of leave that open as I for for food for thought. Like, what's next? What happens? How do you feel? So I don't necessarily answer the question: Is it a lifesaver or is it a leviathan? But I kind of want to leave it up to the reader to fill in the blanks, ask those questions, and I, I mean I think it's a good starting point for a conversation, a deeper conversation. And that's how I, I viewed my story, Fernando. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and I, I think um, some of those themes are recurring because um, there are themes that are recurring in today's world. And, and certainly if we project forward and we look at totalitarian regimes and the type of um, technologies they might be using and the, the, the types of systems they might be implementing, um, you know, through history, they've always kind of used what's available. And so it would absolutely make sense, right, that they would continue to. Um, and I think you also make a valid point um, about the short format being really difficult <laughs> to, 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 to um, winnow things down. But uh, I think a, it does give um, some opening for some, some future expansion, absolutely. Um, which I think would be great. Uh, I know I felt the same way. I'm, I'm sure um, lots of others have as well. Um, and uh, we'll ask Sylvia about it when, when she's up. Um, but uh, I think also it, it it's going to, I think another thing is these scenarios, I think are going to be a great kicking off point for conversation. You know, uh, everybody's building a world and, and they're, you know, they're, they're not identical, but they're very similar. Um, you know, everybody's kind of building their own world based on on that prompt. And so, um, you know, in, in your case, you know, you've got this technology and you've got, um, you know, the, the legalization and illegalization of life forms. Um, and so, you know, you can extrapolate from that what's what's the, the down the road, what could be the end result of that. So I think that's that's really um, that really opens up to some some really interesting conversations. Um, and certainly I could see this being. Uh, some of these um, really great um, entries being prompts, maybe for conversations um, at a government level or at uh, at an organizational level, and you know you could just drop one of these on 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 the desk and say, hey, look, um, what would you know? What's you know? How do how do we get to this world? How do we avoid this world? How do we how do we live in this world? And and I think that's a um, I, I I think these are going to be really thought provoking and, and and this is a this is a great example of that yeah exactly. um, so great thank you yeah and uh i appreciate your time i know that uh you're only going to be with us for a few more minutes so um uh before we move on i don't know if anybody i haven't been watching the chat i don't know if anybody has any questions or comments if not uh, we can keep rolling um, yeah i i would just add that um what you said about this being appropriate to throw on someone's desk, maybe at a government level, maybe even a corporation level, because it, it's kind of the, the theme that I went for was that a lot of us jump to technology where a lot of us are technologists and it seems like an obvious place to start. Like we'll just fix it with technology. But but in the, in the, in the eco F world, technology is there. I mean, it's even in other stories, it's there, but we're still, we're still facing that plus two degrees increase in temperature and we failed. So the idea is these kinds of stories, these scenarios help us think about that those ramifications when, when it's too late, you know, technology might be able to help us stave off the worst case scenario if we act now but if we wait until 2050 and we're faced with everything so we're just going along extracting from nature you know allowing oil uh, companies to expand tremendously for the next decade or two well you know i i, I get that there's a, a trade-off between economics and needing to make money for a, a company or country but um but we're ing ingenious people. People, humans are ingenious mm -hmm. by nature. We could figure it out if we decided to. We just, it's easier just to keep making money, doing the same thing we're doing, and we'll fix it when 
we can't have any other choice and then that's where this story ends up is we're there we have no other choice now technology is there doing all those grazing things but life isn't better for humans in fact it's it's pretty terrible if you are told that you have to register your dna and you're illegal if you don't and by the way you might not be able to procreate because of whatever reason you're not the right race you're not the right color you're not the right height you're not the right intellect and then uh you go back to if we say history repeats itself, you know, you think about the eugenics era and we're, we're back there again. And that's kind of what that is, is kind of like if you don't learn the lessons from history, you're destined to repeat them. And uh, right. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as the saying goes, history may not repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. And so whether whether it repeats itself exactly or not, yeah, it's definitely um, there's always that 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 danger. Uh, I think also, you know, I mean, the carbon isn't there because of cooking fires coming out of caves. It's there because of technology. So, um, you know, it is very much a, a, a double edged sword. So um, it's it's gotten us to where we are um, and definitely need the opportunity for it to um to take us where we need to be and rob you have your hand up thank you thank you thank you so much gina uh great idea for a story horse genius um let's talk about fiction as a mechanism i know that you could write a magazine research article on eugenics in 2023 i know you can do the research and i can write nonfiction about this and research oriented i know you uh, but a vehicle of fiction. Tell me or talk about why fiction is a choice here to influence policy now. Well, fiction is safe because the definition of fiction is that there are no facts, right? It's So you can just take that off the table. You don't have to worry about fact checking. If it's future looking and it's fiction, then it frees the mind to just imagine the possibilities, just to consider them without your brain pinging every single time. And I wonder if that's true. And I wonder if that's true. And, you know, kind of like it takes you out of it. And then if you find something that maybe isn't quite true, then you disregard it. So by using fiction, you take that off the table and you can literally hand somebody something that could be fairly short, provocative, well-written so that it keeps their attention long enough. And it's giving them permission to just play in that creative space in their mind without having to worry about if it's true or not. So I think that that right there, especially in uh, in a world where we're faced with deep fakes and you know nobody knows what's real anymore sometimes online. So, but if it's fiction and you call it fiction and you say you know this is just a future scenario for you to consider, um, it's a lot safer. And then. I would add to that that if I was writing a fiction piece about eugenics into the in the future, I would do research and I would cite my research because I do think that future futurist writing shouldn't just be pure fiction. I think that you can write, you look at history, you look at what's happening now, you can cite those. And then you can project into the future. And of course, there's no facts about the future, so you can be free but you can still anchor it in a lot of what's happening now. So people, so you build that integrity into the, into the story by doing a lot of research to say, you know, this isn't beyond the realm of possibility because look at all of these instances that we've perceived or we, we've experienced over the past and pick your time frame, right? You want to go back a thousand years, hundred years, 50 years. Um, and I guarantee you, it, like we just said, uh, history history does repeat itself, or at least it rhymes. So I guarantee you whatever's happening today, you could look back and say this happened already, but we didn't learn our lesson, or we didn't pay attention, or hey, you know, uh, maybe we didn't before. Or we don't we remember. <laughs> or we don't remember. I hope that answers your question, Rob. Absolutely. It does. Yeah. Sylvia, I don't know if you have um, thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for asking. I, I see also that Bezier has a question. Um, but just maybe to, to, add, to what Gina said, I, I'm completely aligned. I was wondering also, like trying to reflect on, on my own writing. Um, I think when you, you write nonfiction, in a sense, you want to be exhaustive, like you would 
you talked about the steeper or pester approach, like scanning the whole environment. So when you write a report, you don't want to miss anything. When you write fiction, you can choose a perspective. And I will talk about my piece, but for example, I don't focus on technology on this specific uh, writing. If I would do a report, I would really try to, to go in all dimensions. So you don't need to be as balanced as even. You can choose one perspective and that's really what creates emotion because you put people in the shoes of someone, uh, you develop a story, what happened to them in their everyday life, you give it to sense, you give it to feel. So that's really powerful to, to use fiction in such settings. Awesome. Yeah, no, absolutely agree. I mean, it, it can be very powerful. Um, I, I think my take on it is, you know, as far as I'm concerned, science fiction itself is kind of the lingua franca today for so many people. You know, if I say that something is kryptonite, there's a huge part of the population knows exactly what that means. If I say that, you know, you use the Jedi mind trick on someone and, you know, you can think of all kinds of things that come out of science fiction that, you know, you just throw off the cuff and people understand. Um, so I, I think there's definitely, um, there's definitely some common ground there, some common understanding. It's, it's such a big part of, of our storytelling now. And it always has been to some extent. It's just that this, it's gotten more sciencey uh, over time. I think the other thing too, is that it does provide something of a safe space, um, you know, going all the way back to, you know, HG Wells through Rod Serling's Twilight Zone through Star Trek, you know, uh, it's an abstraction layer that allows you to talk about things that maybe you can't talk about otherwise. You know, um, in the height of the Cold War, Rod Serling wrote, the monsters are due on Maple Street. And essentially, it's a Cold War allegory, uh, which many of his stories were, um, as were so many of the stories in Star Trek. You know, Star Trek was able to give us the first uh, interracial kiss on American television because it was, you know, a, a, an abstraction layer that allowed it to happen. And actually, it was a, you know, it was it was a science fiction trope that allowed it to happen because it wasn't voluntary. But um, but yeah, still it was there. Um, and even despite being involuntary for the for the characters, um, it still got some TV stations to drop it. So I, I think um, it providing that that layer. Um, allows us to be a bit more free to uh, to explore some of these ideas while at the same time um, it's such a common uh, it's such a common language now that uh, that uh, that it's something that I think everybody understands to some extent and uh, haven't forgotten you Basir so um, go for it what's your question or comment it was uh, two of my uh, uh, favorite, three of my favorite uh, futurists. So not uh, Fernando as the science fiction buff, explorer, investigator, and presenter. Uh, Gina with all of those uh, wonderful methods, explorations on the balls, and Sylvia always as an explorer. I guess it's not a question of history. Perhaps it's a, more of a question of economics because economics always thinks of rational actor, and uh, the decency of the markets, <laughs> a magic hand that uh, regulates it. So obviously from economics, then, you know, if there's such a science called economics, why do we get so many economic bubbles every five years, 10 years, 15 years? And like, uh, and I'm not even counting the uh, Ponzi schemes. So perhaps to remedy that, is there a way for your content to be more to try to reach out to more people. Perhaps you introduce your work, the uh, Smithsonian Institute, because it is uh, an institution that tries to capture everything that's being done in America and obviously work on science. And that would be able to perhaps hopefully get work to a much uh, broader audience, just an idea thinking out loud. But uh, obviously people, it takes a little time for people to realize uh, the value of work, the significance and the urgency, but keep on rocking. Thank you. One of the things I love about um, doing Zooms with this year is I, I never know where he's going to be coming from, um, and it's always a great question. And it's always it's always um, it's it's always uh, a surprise, and, and it makes me think a little bit. I, I agree. Um, you would think that um, that uh, economics would would uh, play a role in this, and I know it does in some of the stories, either directly or indirectly, um, because of the technologies. Um, 
But yeah, that does definitely, it definitely feels like it's a broader question than something you can a answer in 500 to a thousand words. So um, in, in the case of, of our stories, I think we're, we're looking to do a little bit more of a just general world building and kind of give you a, a taste or a feel of what it might be and, and from different perspectives. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, from Andy Hines work on after capitalism to, um, you know, back to Star Trek, you know, their, their, their post money society, I, I think, um, there's, there's definitely some futures that we can look at that, um, that change how markets work, um, or how those in markets think. So, um, so definitely something to ponder. Um, but, uh, but yeah, just a, a little bit outside of our scope, just because of, of the, the restrictions that we put on the prompts, but uh, great question. All right. So, um, for the, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and, and move on to, uh, to our next author, Sylvia Galliser. And, uh, the title of her work is Vichy different seasons. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I would say, first of all, well, it's always a real honor to contribute to, to, um, a futurist publication and especially to collaborate on this one, on this book on ecofascism and does the leadership of Fernando and Rome. Um, and, among so many futurist friends, and, and actually Grace Van Gill's member as well, if you see the whole list of authors, there are a lot of Grace Van Gill colleagues in, in it. And Gina, I completely echo your words. It's always such a treat to be in a conversation with you. And, um, and I am so amazed by your talent and creativity and also empathy. And I, I really, uh, can't wait to read your chapter. Um, so my, my, my story, my relationship to the book. So um, when from, um reach out to me at first to contribute on this book. Um, I have to say my first reaction was a bit um, ambivalent um, because for Europeans, there's always a sort of epidermic reaction to the word fascism itself. And, and we did the sort of imposter syndrome as like, I'm not in a position to talk about this. How could I address something? as large and as shameful um, as this part of our European history. Um, at the same time, I, of course, wanted to embrace the challenge and, and, and dissect this apparent contradiction between, on one end, like ecological initiatives, and on the other end, fascism. And I admit, uh, it's been quite painful uh, to write. I hope you'll appreciate the results, and I, I can give you some background. I, why I came up with that story and that title. Um, so in my in my story, I address a range of topics uh, from overpopulation to carbon quotas, um, also animal food restrictions, and more generally, possible consequences of what an eco extremist uh, government could bring. And for once, we were mention, uh, mentioning economics and technology. Well. On my end, I parted a bit from technology, which is usually like my cup of tea, um, to address more politics, regulations, policies, and their impact on the future of humanity, empathy, and tolerance. Um, there's one concept I introduced, the one of human growth planning from the perspective of a minister. Um, so it's a very personal and intimate story um, where I try to investigate one, one's sentiment um, of doing things right, um, also the sentiments of, of, of guilt and responsibility. I also introduce another um, complex concept, the one of, of gross residences where people are sent in their end of life that, um, of course, eco-concentration camps. I made the conscious choice um, of setting this story in France, which is my home country, um, in memory of the pain um, that this country uh, went through the last century. And I wanted to talk also about something uh, personal and close to my culture and embody it in one of our signature products, namely charcuterie ham, sausages, saucisson, um, something that is now a scene um, in the 2040s with meat consumption and meat trade uh, being forbidden by law. And I place the story in the very city of Vichy, 
um, which you might have heard about. Um, in, in this case of the story following a major event that happened in 2040, which is, of course, an echo to what happened um, in 1940. And I tried to illustrate the consequences. So, of course, there's a, a symbolic a symbol in this, uh, given it is a century after the Vichy government became the official government of France and supported the Nazis um, during World War II. Um, on top of that, I, I really wanted to, to show, to illustrate ways you come to compromise your personal values uh, to serve the fascist governments, ways you also come to betray your own family and your origins, and also ways you can, you can enter in resistance and the risks and guilt attached to it. And finally, I try to and in a positive note with ways to, to redeem yourself. Um, and finally, in terms of, of format, uh, the, the form itself of the writing, I, I opted for something I'm not used to. Once again, I wanted to explore, busy as you said, I'm an explorer. So I wanted to ex explore um, an expressionist form. So it's close to expressionism and spoken poetry, actually in the style of Paul Celan, um, I, you might be familiar with his uh, Black Milk of Daybreak in the Todos Fuge, which is a writing um, about the concentration camps. And I really want to commemorate uh, those past tragedies and show how history repeats itself or, or creates patterns and echoes over time, like in waves, and, and, and to help us prevent that to happen. And the title itself, like Vichy, Different Seasons, um, is finally a reference to a collection of four novellas um, by my role model in writing, Stephen King. Uh, you might know um, that book. It's not the most famous one, but it definitely have one of the four novellas of the, the short story, um, Apt Pupil, uh, which I really invite you to read. Uh, it's a story of the kind of, of strange friendship between a child, a young boy, and, and uh, uh, a Nazi and uh, another identity. Um, and I want to kind of bring some of, of that atmosphere to the story. So I, I hope my, my writing brings you to, to consider possible futures, of course, reflect and challenge the existing. Thank you. That's amazing. Um, yeah, it, it's really it's really touching um you know that you you've got so much of a of a personal connection to it um you know because of the history I, um as just I not even start with the history just different seasons yeah it's it's an amazing book most people don't don't necessarily recognize the title but um apt pupil became a a a big movie, uh, Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption from that book became the Shawshank Redemption. The body became Stand By Me. So I'm trying to remember what the fourth novella is, um, but it escapes me. But yeah, it, that became a monster hit as movies for Stephen King and, and some of his best writing for sure. Um, so I'm, I'm a huge fan as well. Um, but yeah, it, it, this, definitely, um, this definitely does have some echoes of history um and certainly um yeah you're right uh, uh fascism just the term is is definitely a, a a delicate subject um certainly in europe um and and more and more it's it's becoming a topic of conversation in the united states as well and and in in other parts of the world um where uh where governments are starting to shift um uh, away from liberal values and more towards um, conservative and, and, and centralized um, concepts. So um, a concept that might have been unthinkable or radical a few years ago, um, you know, it, we're starting to get concerned about as well. And certainly, um, to your point, in, in Europe, something um, that Europe is familiar with, but that at this point, it's older Europeans, right? Um, and, and so the memory of that may start to fade and that um, that gives it the opportunity to rise again. Um, so definitely something, something to be concerned about. Um, but yeah, this is it's great, great work. Um, it's very, uh, very moving. Um, 
Yeah, absolutely. Any, any, before we move on, any, uh, any questions or discussion? Any, uh, anything anyone wants to bring up about uh, this particular work? Yeah, on the point. Sorry, sorry, please go, Gordon. Sorry. Uh, just real quick, uh, Sylvia, I uh, appreciate how I use the right word painful this has to be to reflect on things that happened before we were born, but are a part of our history. Uh, as a matter of casting futures, uh, that seems new for you to go so negative. Uh, was that a conscious choice? Is that true? Or say a little more about that, because I think you and I agree, we're always looking for how do we create a positive future people want to live in? Uh, I, I, that's me anyhow, and I, I think you're you're usually there too, but uh, can you comment on that? I, I appreciate you at that, actually. Um, I haven't realized it myself that I, I usually write more about positive future. I like to to have always so silver lining in, in stories and so on. I admit this one, like the the title, the world invited me to something darker. And I don't know, from the start, I went to write something in, in the style of, of, of that story from Stephen King. So something just imposed itself on me. And I was like, I need to explore that darker road. It would be too easy to just try and escape it. And I don't know, I was brought down with the, with the topic. Um, I still hope the end of the story uh, brings that silver lining. But yeah, yeah that's a good you. point. Like usually, I, I would say we were talking about writing. Um, I think there are two two types of writing as well, or like uh, or, or probably more than two. But within fiction, it's not just one way to think about fiction. I like to differentiate. Sometimes it's about just writing scenarios, and you you force yourself. It's it's closer to nonfiction in that sense that you have a methodology. You extrapolate from signals. You force yourself to have different types of scenario, like the the for alternate future and so on. Um, in that story, I feel I'm probably closer to, to science fiction in the sense that I'm detaching from reality to really like go dark with one topic. And, and in that case, it's not that much about being balanced at like almost being brought down by the story itself. I don't know if that answers exactly your questions. but No, yeah, it, it does. It's, it's, it's going to be very powerful and I look forward to it. Thank you. I kind of feel like we 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 kind of painted you into a corner too because we didn't say hey what's your what's your best eco future and we threw you into eco fascism it's it's kind of hard to uh, it's kind of hard to, um, to to write a super upbeat story about eco fascism um, so yeah I, I think I think we can take some of the blame for that as well Sylvia uh, all 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 future fiction is written about the present I. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading your story. You know, I love your work. Um, given the story, the majority of it, where would I look to see where it's happening? Is it happening in France? Is it, where is this happening now? You know what? I would say California, actually. I, I, I'm oh. sometimes surprised <laughs> by how young people yeah, I'm like so this. Surprised by that. More, please. Yeah, so I actually I, I feel really um like young people from school sometimes they they come back with messages that are really surprising to me, like not tolerant about people drinking alcohol or people smoking or people eating meat. And 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 I feel sometimes I need to tell my children about like freedom and liberty of choice of other people because they have this message that's called that there's one healthy way to live your life and if, if you get out of it it's 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 not the right way and and I kind of try to balance that with more tolerance so from my experience I I see some part of of let's say some some stems of ecofascism sometimes around me yeah thank you <laughs> But it might happen in many other places. I'm just relating to my own experience. Mm -hmm. My neck of the woods. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I grew up uh, in a Gaddafi's world. My family moved out of the Gaddafi world and temporarily to Ceausescu. <laughs> so already uh, before I was 18, I've seen <laughs> those two. And then uh, here in Turkey, not too distant. And a lot of the times in uh, fascism, 
and authoritarianism, autocracy. There's also kleptocracy. Kleptocracy in the sense that in means of distribution of resources and so forth, where you have the in-group and the out-group. And the in-group always takes uh, a lot of the benefits. You know, so, I mean, I'll just leave it at that. And then if anyone has more information, you can reach out. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Monsieur. All right. Uh, moving along, because I know we're getting a little tight on time. Um, so, and I actually, I've got, I spoke to Antonia. She can't make it, but I'm going to be talking about her work a little bit as well. Um, but before we get to that, I um, wanted to mention mine, um, which the, the title of mine is Roanoke. Um, and so initially when, when I got the idea, when I, when I got the prompt for ecofascism, I had this whole idea of, you know, prison, you know, ecofascist prisoners, you know, talking with each other and kind of developing their world that way. Um, you know, a little bit of kiss of the spider woman, I guess. And then, uh, I think it was Sylvia that said, well, I can't wait to see what you write about space. I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, no, no, and, and afterwards I was like, yeah, you know what, I think it would have been really difficult. It would have been way too far in my comfort zone to, to do that, um, especially with the editorial duties. So instead, of course, mine is about space, and the title of mine is Roanoke. And um, for those who may not know U.S. Uh, or North American history, because it wasn't it's not really U.S. history yet, uh, Roanoke was the first British colony established uh, in in North America, essentially, and uh, within a few years, it disappeared, and it's still a mystery as exactly what happened to the colony. Um, so I decided that I was going to write my piece about the Roanoke colony uh, as being the first permanent establishment on Mars. And so um, the what I the take that I took on mine, uh, I wrote it actually as a press release. Um, based on a, a speech given by um, by uh, the, the, the person in charge of the Mars colony, um, reacting to the world government on Earth, um, essentially having, um, and again, it, having suspended all um, uh, space activity on Earth. So um, there's there, there's a little bit of write what you know, and I know Gina talked about that, and 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 Sylvia obviously um, very eloquently explained, um, you know, the the history behind uh, her writing, and in my case, uh, in, in doing a lot of research on the impacts of climate uh, on the climate um, of the the current space boom. Um, and mainly because of my focus on Latin America and, and the fact that you know um, we've we've always we're always worried about the Amazon and and the different biomes in, in Latin America, um, and so kind of took it from there. And so um, what happens when you have uh, a population that's on Mars? It's a large enough population that they just can't pick up and leave. Um, so what happens then when the Earth government decides that uh, for the greater sake of the planet, um, there will no longer be any uh, space uh, related activities, no more launches, no more recoveries uh, from Earth? What happens to those folks that are, you know, 100 million miles away? And that's that's the that's the gist of mine. And again, because of the short format, um, rather than trying to to to, to write uh, a couple of paragraphs or, or a page or two. I just went ahead and um, wrote it as a, as a press release. Um, you know, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Bram Stoker's Dracula. And uh, I, I love um, how, you know, that, that book kind of intertwines letters and telegrams and, and bits of story. So I thought it'd be kind of cool to write a press release. And, uh, and so it's formatted that way. So, um, so yeah, essentially that's what it is, and it's um, it's like I said, it's it's essentially um, for immediate release, and and it's the comments of the um, administrator of the Roanoke Colony, um, essentially pleading for um, for Earth to reconsider uh, for the good of 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 the inhabitants on on Mars. So I don't know if anyone has any questions or anything they'd like to talk about regarding that. That one's fairly straightforward. 
Uh, I got one for you. Um, since Roanoke, the historical Roanoke had a unresolved outcome. Uh, is it a spoiler to tell us if you have one in this book or not? <laughs> well, um, I don't think it's a spoiler because, like I said, the 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 format of mine is a press release, um, and it's the the administrator for the colony essentially saying, "Look, if if uh, you know if you follow through on this law that you've implemented, then um, this is going to be what happens to the colony." So it's it's kind of a, a now you can extrapolate out and kind of like what Gina said uh, about her piece that it was very, very limiting. And as a writer, you get a little bit frustrated by that. I kind of feel like it's for me, it's a jumping off point. I, I feel like I could write an entire at least short story um, for separate submission based on this and, and just kind of take it to its full resolution. Um, you know, and, and kind of take folks. So this is almost like a like a teaser. This is almost like the trailer. Yeah. Um, and what happens from here, you know, are, are they going to be able to mark Watney their way out of this or, uh, you know, are they going to disappear or, or what's going to happen? So, Great. yeah, it's, it's not a spoiler to tell you that it doesn't get resolved in a page and a half, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely, um, I, I enjoyed writing it. Um, it was a different format for me. I actually had to go and pull up a whole bunch of press releases and, and see how they're formatted and, and really internalize it. Uh, yeah, so it's good. And I haven't, we have, we don't have artwork for it yet. This piece of artwork isn't for it, um, but I am looking forward to seeing what the, what the AI generates. Um, yeah, I, I can imagine the challenge of trying to write fiction uh, using the AP style guide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Um, for sure, yeah. Now the style guy just goes out the window uh, for the most part. Uh, I did run it by by someone who's in public relations who does do a lot of press releases and um, a personal friend who um, who um, who I share some other works with and uh, and he said, oh, it's a great looking press release. Um, so yeah, I was, I was happy with that. Um, so I know that we're getting close to the end. So I'm just going to talk about Antonia's. Uh, work and hers is titled for the common good. Um, I've read it a few times and I reread it, re reread it again today. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background, uh, Antonia has been working on her certificate uh, in in futures and foresight through the uh, through the futures school. Um, and so she had been working on uh, recently on on uh, climate based scenarios. So she was saying that that gave her a good background for for putting together this story. Um, you know, having having done the brainstorming, having talked about climate futures and things like that, gave her a lot of background. And just like Gina said, just like Sylvia said, and I said, you know, you it feels like to some extent um, we're writing what we know, and she knows what she knows on this based on the fact that she's been doing this this uh, futures program. So. Um, so she was able to, to extrapolate um, based on those scenarios. And then in terms of technology, um, she incorporated a good bit of technology, uh, not, not, not necessarily down some bolts, but it's certainly pervasive throughout her work. So um, the title of the work is For the Common Good, and it centers around Camila Lopez, who's a, a, a teenager from Bogota. And um, what's happened to Camila is that um, there's been equatorial drought that has created climate refugees um, as the as the the earth heats the equator is drying out and so uh, the water systems in in Colombia have failed the lakes have dried up the reservoirs have dried up and now they are climate refugees and um, rather than the situations that we see in some works where climate refugees wind up migrating in this case um, China sponsors refugee camps within Colombia uh, according to her her story. Um, where um, where they basically collect or concentrate uh, uh, climate refugees um, to be able to provide for them and support them, um, and the title of the program is for the common good, um, and this is a worldwide program that the Chinese are implementing in order to um, to to address these climate refugees and uh, and I guess kind of keep them where they are instead of having them migrate all over the place. Um, you know, it's it, her work is absolutely draconian um, in a lot of ways, uh, 
you know, it, it definitely feels a bit like, I mean, it, it, it feels like it touches on some themes about European concentration camps. It feels a bit like um, the internment camps that the U.S. had primarily for Japanese Americans during World War II, um, you know, which they were supposedly doing for, for their own good. Um, and so, um, again, the main, th uh, there's a, a big theme is using the a technology to track and monitor individuals, uh, subdermal technologies and, and, and other technologies that we're familiar with and, and some that are a bit more advanced because it's obviously in the future. Um, and I just really found it a, a chilling vision uh, of the efficient use of technology to control large populations. Um, and again, that's through in, in implants and through sensors. And then, um, you know, we walk, into the camp with Camilla so we kind of know what her experience is with the media before she goes in and after she goes in and we know China has a habit of, of you know really controlling um, media experience within within areas that they control so um, so that one was really um, really chilling I, I, I found it very moving um, and uh, definitely uh, definitely I think one that's going to um, feel very impactful and emotional for, for readers when they, when they get a chance to read it. And so that's it. That's our book, Ecofascism, Leviathan or Lifesaver. Um, thank you for your time. And you know, the link to the page is down here at the bottom. And I believe Rob's gonna be sharing links. And I don't know if we have time for discussion because it's almost a half hour, um, but Rob, you can, uh, uh, yeah, thank you so much. You can let us uh, keep talking you. if anybody's got questions. Or if we've got a couple. Of, we got uh, one more question. If that one fits, thank you for this. Uh, it's good to see us spread and uh, to share it out. Uh, and uh, I put the link to the, uh, the publication that we have. Yes, uh, in the chat as well. I'm looking forward to the publication. Fernando, uh, perhaps you could mention like the group that's behind this. Um, the one day people are doing multiple publications. You may want to mention that to the folks. Yeah, yeah. There, there is another one that I'm not working with. <laughs> so I, uh, yeah, okay. yeah, I'm not, I'm not that familiar with it. But, um, but yeah, there, uh, it, it is, it is a, a, a great group um, that's doing some really, um, really interesting work. Um, and looking at these possible futures um, in, in 2050. Obviously, this one is is very dark because it's um, it's eco fascism. But um, um, you know, they've uh, they're also looking at uh, one called uh, they're working on one called Cli climate utopias, um, which I guess you could say is the antithesis of uh, climate. Um, uh, eco fascism, and uh, I don't know if if maybe Sylvia would have fit better <laughs> with her with her upbeat uh, and positive futures writing in, in climate utopias, but uh, but uh, that is another another work that the group is uh, participating in. Yeah, I've got a chapter in that one, and uh, your your inclination is right. It was it's the flip side of writing. Like when you're worried about things and being anxious and writing the positive side, it takes some rewrites to get the negative stuff out. Oh yeah, I, I would imagine so. I mean, certainly coming from you know a generation where uh, we were the generation that sat in the theater to watch you know Mad Max and the Terminator and and all of these kind of dystopian futures, it's uh it's very easy to um it's very easy to uh to go dark. It's just kind of, kind of, you know, our default. So get away from that. That's, can be a, a challenge. that's the name of your book. It's very easy to go dark. <laughs> I have that on a T-shirt. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you so much for your time and efforts, and we Thank look you. forward to the publication. When it comes out, we will run it through the guild and focus on uh, the talents that uh, are gathered in all our swans. And we keep gathering together and keep overlapping each other and connected in different ways. I feel stronger for the efforts. Thank you so much, Sylvia, awesome. Fernando, you. Gina, uh, and everybody. Thanks so much. Uh, it's just the notes. So we're back to the main session. I'm going to just pause.